Hello everyone, you're on Aikido Italia Network and you're watching the IKA links with Simone Chierchini. Uh, today we have the pleasure of hosting William Gillespie. Welcome William, nice having you. Thank you. Well nice, thank you for having me. You, I, oh. Now you think it's good, I don't know about afterward, you may have regrets, but thank you for, thank you for having me. I, no, no, that's not my kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> no I'm buyer's right remorse. Reason. <laughs> I'm ready to listen. I think there's always something to, to learn, you know. Um, how's life over there? Good. Today was a good day. It's, uh, it's sunny and nice in Tokyo. And uh, I met uh, Francesco in the park and did a little bit of uh, weapons and some other practice with him. People are out in Yoyogi Park enjoying it. All kinds of groups. This group doing boxing, that group doing yoga, that group doing something else. And... Um, then these two strange foreigners with sticks whacking each other. That was us. <laughs> it was good. Yeah. Well, it, it's nice to see that people are resilient, you no, know, and they find they find a way anyway. And that's uh, well, as yeah. I said about the Japanese. You know, the Japanese. When you live in a country that has you know uh, Kazan volcanoes and Jishin earthquakes and typhoons and tsunamis. You're not necessarily going to wet the bed over something else that comes along and kills you. <laughs> you know, they're kind of used to they're kind of used to the fact nature might take them out at any moment. So the response has been different than my my homeland and or my adopted homeland, the UK. So it's good. It's a good place to be. I suppose it's a good reminder, no? That uh, indeed they were small and frail. Yeah, memento mori, right? You know, remember, you will die. Yep. There you go, right? The Stoics, and for sure. No, absolutely. I, I, you know, you mentioned you read my book, and I had to deal with the fact my wife was chronically ill for 17 years and literally could fall over at any moment, dead, you know, on any given day. But having to deal with that pressure, and then also you're already trying to live life as like a budoka, and so you're trying to be engaged in the moment. But um, to be patient with some of my friends for whom this is the first experience with you know um whether to what extent it's really a, a fact that it could happen to them based on age etc but you know it's sort of been unsettling unbalancing for them they've had to learn how to take ukemi and they don't know how to take ukemi okay. and we all know what that first experience was like in the dojo when we first tried to take ukemi and we didn't know how so yeah, there's a lot of people out there that are questioning the uh, use of usefulness of uh, budo. Well, here you go. This True. is what it's for. Anyway, absolutely. Do you know? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, uh, I have to send you. I have to send you a Christmas present now. It's the, the one guy that bought one. Oh yeah, that's me. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Eat in Japan and the way less traveled. Right. Uh, I, I actually truly enjoyed it, and I recommend it to all Aikido lovers. Thank you. So thank you. Very I mean, it's not a, it, it's, I had to be careful in doing it. So I didn't want to be, you know, there's people in high places. I didn't want them to take it the wrong way. And it's really just my experience. You know, I'm not trying to tell people how to do, this is how you do Ikkyo. This is how you, no, not at all. No. You know, at the end, there's a bit of my experiences in teaching in MMA schools. And also there's a bit of the colorful nightlife in Japan and different places, which people might find interesting. But on the whole, it just tracks the calendar year at Humble Dojo, what happens every year in the dojo, what happened to me. And I, I tend to be the butt of most of the jokes, you know, in it. So, well, anyway. Uh, pick from it right from the start. Uh, actually, let's start from the very beginning. You happen to grow up in Southern California. Correct. Right. Uh, this is one of the areas in the world outside of Japan with the strongest Japanese cultural presence. And this is where you developed as, an, uh, as a person, first of all, right. as an Aikidoka. And you also 
had a, an excellent job over there. Uh, right. Could you tell us a little bit about that time of your life in California? Well, sure. I was I was born down behind the Orange Curtain, as we called it, Orange County, back in the day. And, um, you know, so you grow up in sort of an outdoors, robust kind of culture. Like whenever I met Australians or South Africans overseas, you know, they're swimming and they're surfing and they're really active. So I kind of grew up, uh, you know, in that sort of culture in California. And two doors down from my house. I mean, I lived in Orange County when there were still orange groves. And uh, two doors down from my house was the Japanese family, they were flower farmers. And my first Japanese friend, I was probably four or five, I think. You know, at that age, you don't think about these things. I was like a little blonde haired, you know, toe headed kid and he's a Japanese kid, but you don't go, oh, my friend's Japanese and I'm, you know, blonde Caucasian. You don't think about that. I mean, I just thought, man, his mom's so calm and pretty. She's so nice, you know, and her dad, his dad loved uh, fishing and didn't talk a lot, you know? And um, so I, I did have exposure to East Asian culture at an early age. And you're right, Los Angeles, outside of Tokyo and Sao Paulo has the most people of Japanese descent of I think any city on the planet. And um, I, I didn't, you know, at that young an age, I didn't really, my interest wasn't peaked in martial arts. I moved up to the Bay Area. So I don't really have this SoCal, NoCal, you know, uh, hostility that a lot of people have. I kind of grew up in both ends of the state, but got interested in martial arts up there. And it was interesting. My father, I wanted to go, there was a really good judo skill at school, Cahill Judo, and I'd wanted to go. I wrestled in seventh and eighth grade for my junior high. They have quite competitive sort of inter-school sports in California back in the day. And um, back in the day where they weren't handing out trophies to everybody. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, you know, I was interested in going, but I think because my father's experience, maybe with the war or something, you know, he wasn't that interested in me going and doing martial arts, which is odd because he married someone of German descent, you know, and um, I grew up in a house that spoke uh, German. I knew my grandmother, my, my uh, Oma and Grossi, you know, I got German food once a week. And uh, I had kind of more of an immigrant upbringing in a lot of ways, although I'm second generation on that side. But then um, finally, when I went back down to Southern California, I had heard about, I knew about Aikido. I tried a class in 1977 in the city, in the Mission District in San Francisco, just too far to go. And then when I got out of law school, I went down and signed up at a place where I knew a guy had trained there before. It was in Little Tokyo. Looked like something out of 17th century Japan. The teacher literally shipped in craftsmen to help him build it. I mean, Furuya Sensei's, um, he's extraordinary, eccentric, peculiar, you know, different. Uh, you know, um, I'm grateful that I, he helped set me on this path. And it was an interesting experience. It was down in Little Tokyo. And at that time, if you walk, if you wandered like a block to the right or a block to the left, it was like being in the living dead or you know, Dawn of the Dead or something. <laughs> <laughs> he, he had these two dogs, Kuma and Michiko, and Kuma would kind of take the, I think he took the backside of more sets of trousers than, you know, he would chase all the vagrants out of the alley. And uh, I joined and just got stuck in the first couple of years. And then he asked me, did I want to become like Ken Shusei? And there were just three of us. And he, he, was, he was extraordinary. I mean, he, I think he started off in Kendo. He's Sansei, third generation. Um, in America. And then he switched at a very young age to Aikido. He lived in Humble Dojo in 1969 for a year. He then went to Harvard and got his master's degree in Japanese studies um, and studied with Kanai Sensei. He then came back and Dojo asked him to support Tiba Sensei and then, you know, sort of evolved from there. So I was fortunate. I got to train in an extraordinary environment. I got to uh, train with some very dedicated people. And like you said, I was lucky. It's a matter of, of birth. I just happened to be born in a good place for learning East Asian culture and, and Japanese martial arts. So I consider myself fortunate. Yes. Uh, could you tell us some story from the good old days? I'm sure Furuya Sensei passed on some Nice. Well, 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 from when he was in Japan, sure. I mean, Arikawa Sensei is legendary. He used to hold himself up on the subway and the, the trains between stops 
but you'd hold it as part of his training. You know, people like to say the whole world's your dojo and um, you can make it that. I mean, I do odd things on buses like not hold on and check my, that's my balance oh, and all these sorts of things. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, Aikido Otaku, Aikido Geek or Budoka Otaku, the Budo Geek. Um, yeah, so he would do this kind of thing. And then he also told me one day that he, someone was not supposed to be smoking on the train and he helped the man put out his cigarette, you know, right, <laughs> right into his face. And then um, he, yeah, so he would tell me these kinds of stories, but um, not not too colorful. I know I know of the story of an American that that showed up at Hombo Dojo and wanted to live there and was denied living there. And then he held a grudge for the rest of his life and <laughs> wrote prolifically about Aikido for the rest of his life. You know, my teacher was there when it happened. So um, yeah, he would, you know, it, Japan then at my teacher's time and the Japan when I got there first in 92 and then 94 and then moved in 97, it was totally different than now. It's much more accessible. The world shrunk has become a lot smaller uh, place with uh, you know pluses and minuses on uh, regarding that point. I talk about I touch on that in the book. You know, talk about us being sort of getting you know, especially when people are talking about culture and all this kind of thing these days. You know, we've been forced into a smaller space by travel, by media, by you know computers, by all this kind. Of thing. So just you know, kind of relax and cut each other some slack and get to know each other and over time people find accommodations you know, to improve relations between people and things tend to work out so other than that i mean Fumiya sensei told me interesting stories about los angeles i mean i got to meet danny Inasanto, i got to meet fumio demura i got to meet tamlin tamita who was daniel san's girlfriend in the second karate kid I got to meet all these kind of people being in Los Angeles. I didn't really care. I mean, I went to UCLA. I, there's, a, well, there's another star, who cares, you know? But um, it was interesting to meet other martial artists. And Furuya Sensei's good friend was Adam Chu, who's a well-known um, Chinese Gong Fu teacher out of uh, Taiwan. He came in every once in a while and taught seminars. And I touch on it in the book. I was there when sort of the Gracie phenomenon started in Los Angeles. Um, and I remember Furuya Sensei, look, someone plopped in the video, the Gracie Challenge video, and he was typing away at his desk, and he just looks up and looks at it, and he goes, yeah, that's old judo. He just went back to work, like, I mean, he, he had an encyclopedic mind for this kind of thing. Um, and then I actually kicked off trying BJJ before I moved to Japan. I went to Hicks and Gracie's first place in Los Angeles. You know, as I like to say, got a cup of coffee there, went for about three months before I moved. So again, I was fortunate to be on the West Coast, fortunate to be in California, you know, so it's made me, I think that shaped my kind of consideration for when I meet other people who've really struggled and tried to learn, but haven't been so blessed or fortunate to be in the right place with the right people, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, at some stage you, decided that this Californian experience wasn't really True. enough. You know, you wanted yeah, something right. else from life, I suppose. So you right. packed it all and moved to Japan. Right. I suppose. Yeah, I, I, I had enough of that sunshine and, and traveling yeah. down to Santa Monica Beach and going body surfing at the end of the day. I just couldn't stand that anymore. Oh, no, no, not at all. But was there actually uh, a spark, something that Mm. I did it, and also yeah. in general, what was the, what were the reasons? Mm. I mean, that's a really good question because when I first got to Japan, some Japanese would look at me like, "What? You came from where to do what?" You know, and um, the spark was I went to visit Japan in 1992 and practiced a little bit at Hombo Dojo, and I thought I just felt comfortable. It's really interesting. Two places I felt very comfortable culturally. One, Scotland. My father's side of the family is all Scottish. And uh, the other was when I came here. And I don't know why, you know, but I did. I loved it. I loved Hombo Dojo. The pace of practice was really attractive. All the teachers, so many foreigners from all over the world at, at that time. We can talk, uh, we can touch on that topic again later. 
I visited for a month in 94. And now what happened was I had a fraternity brother from college that was a lawyer also. And he'd moved to Japan and he was like, come move, quit. You know, I had some girlfriend in Los Angeles. He goes, nah, cut it off. It's not going to work. I just went through that. Come to, come to Tokyo. I had planned this big trip to visit Doug. And uh, I got this phone call from another friend that said, it's in the book. It's in the chapter, Climb Every Mountain. Uh, we said, Doug's dead. And when you first hear that, you're like, it doesn't make any sense. It's like someone says orange juice, cement mixer, you know, barbecue. It just, the words don't make any sense in your head. And then I found out he had climbed Mount Fuji with a bunch of other foreigners in March. Not the smartest thing to do. Not open climbing season. And he stood up to take a picture. Big guy, too. He's about 6'2 and about 2'10, 2'15. And he'd taken a picture and a big gust of wind. And it gets really blustery up there, you know. And he's basically standing on a sheet of ice. And he had crampons on, the whole thing, his ice axe. But it had seemed calm and poof, gone. And just tumbled, you know. Taking Ukemi again when you don't know how to take Ukemi down the mountain, you know, 3,000 feet. So about, what, 1,400 meters. Dead. And then I go to his funeral, which was back in Los Angeles. And he was... Jewish. So we go to the graveside and all of us are gathered back from university. And I'd seen what a great time he had. He had really touched so many different lives with all the different things he'd done. And all these people had, you know, come to this funeral service, which was massive. But because it's a Jewish service, you go and you actually toss the dirt on your friend. You know, you go to the graveside and, pop, you know, dig in and, and toss it in on top of them, at least the way they, they um, mark their faith. And I'll tell you, that's a real reality. Now, I grew up a theologian's kid. I mean, I'm a, I started off as a PK, preacher's kid, but then my father became a theologian, so I'm a TO, a theologian's offspring. <laughs> but what that does is I had ideas of not only the ever after, but meaning of life and all these kind of bigger questions in my head since I was a young kid. And so um, Doug's funeral, I think, would be what took the small spark and built it into a fire. And I went on the same trip where I was going to meet him, and I stayed for a month. And I trained every day. I was lucky. I knew some guys in finance, and I could stay at his flat. Um, I couldn't live like that when I got here. That was about a ten thousand U.S. dollar a month flat I was living in. And then um, decided I loved it and had to go. And I went back to the law firm, and I buried uh, the two biggest bonuses they pay back to back. And then I had a trial. I started off as a trial lawyer. Um, I, I had a trial that, that settled, and I couldn't have been more ecstatic. And I was able to jump on the plane, start of February, and packed everything away, put my stuff in storage, you know. And next thing I knew, I was getting picked up by Tony Hine, getting off the Narita Express, and, uh, you know, wondering if I'd done the right thing. But, you know, half the people thought I was a genius. Half the people thought I was crazy and probably both half right. And I never looked back. You left a job that was, can, can you remind me what you were making with this? Yeah, my job was making about, in current dollars, about 300,000 US dollars a year. And I wasn't even a, a partner yet. So I was all on the right track and all that. So I, I put my money where my mouth is. Whether, that, whether my mouth was in the right place, I don't know. But I put my money where my mouth is and gave it up. Yeah, yeah. I suppose it's not, it's not about money, no? So. Well, you I, better to re, better to try than you know at 70 if i make it that far or 80 at 90 and go oh my god i could have been a contender you know it's uh better to just go do what you want to do and then sort it out as as things go along so i did it yeah uh now um could you describe for us the training culture that you found on the Aikigai Hombu Dojo. Um, have you, did you experience any difficulties at the beginning to, to integrate and afterward, based on your actual experience, uh, what does it really take to become a good and effective uh, deshi at the Aikigai Hombu Dojo? Because we know it's not like a, any other dojo in the world. Right. I mean, look, I'm not a deshi or a kenshusei, but when I went there, I did try to copy that kind of lifestyle by, by I had a lot of money in the bank. I didn't have to work. 
And so I was able to train two to five times a day. And the only reason it would be two is that, that would mean I was helping Tony teach someplace else. And Tony, the truth hind, he's an experience. And to say he's a strong guy, you'd say, yeah. And the Grand Canyon is a big hole in the ground. He's a person that he's a person who boxed before he did Aikido. And he played first division rugby. He was a winger, which means he's quitchy, you know, fast, quick muscle. And about uh, 183 uh, centimeters and about 99 kilos. So people found him difficult <laughs> to train with on a regular basis. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah, imagine that, you know, and, but I, that's my Scottish side. I got stuck in and I'm like, we're closer in age. And so I just got stuck in and trained with him. And I thought this guy beating the stuffing out of me can be really good for me. So I was helping him around Tokyo a couple of days a week and then training the rest of the time. And I, I had, you know, I'd gone twice. So I knew what to expect to a certain degree. And I, my, the, my teach my first teacher, it was very fundamental. And the fundamentals were along the lines of Kishimoto Doshu and, and, uh, you know, Nidai Doshu. And like Furuya Sensei had his own Aikido that he would express. I think, I don't know if I've loaded it on this channel, but it's on a channel in China. Um, I have an old video of him when he's skinny. He's skinny and fast. And one of the UKs of all people is um, Juba Noir, actually, before he moved down to San Diego. So I, I wasn't entirely, I think I've seen people come in before. And we used to call them new meat. They would come in. <laughs> they're not used to the hard mats. They're not used to the fat pra fast practice. And then we bounce on some of them, right? If they were nice, you wouldn't do that. But if they weren't, then you would. Um, so I was used to that. But, you know, to do it that often was tough. And um, what was, you know, it was a different time than now. The world's changed a lot. Japan's changed a lot. And Aikido's changed a lot. One of the most difficult challenges uh, for Aikido is the, is the talent drain. It hadn't happened yet. You know, there were still lots of really strong, physically strong people. You can only make the best pot you can out of the best, you know, clay you've got, or the best sword you can out of the best iron you've got, you know, mm -hmm. and the other ingredients. So um, I found it challenging in this respect that in my old dojo, because you're Kenshusei and because you tend to be, you've been there a while and you, it's a smaller group, you tend to make accommodations for each other in training. This can happen. You know each other. You know each other's technique. You know how to respond. You know not to push maybe too far. But when there's a certain amount of anonymity at a place like Hombu Dojo, which can be very big and very cold, which frankly I think is very good for a lot of the people that come from their home dojo and feel very proud of themselves that they are something special at home. And then they come there and they find out they're just not that special. They're just another yeah. foreigner coming to learn. Wake up, wake up cold. Yeah, it's a good experience for anybody, you know? And so I, th I think I found those things a bit um, challenging. And then of course I got there and my first practice, I got in a fight, it's a friend of mine, he's now a Shihan. We got in a full on fight in the back of the, the, <laughs> the dojo. I ended up wrestling on the ground and people separating me. It was a little bit of a different age. What's that? <laughs> he was. We're still friends. No, we were. We were very close. Now I don't know. He's he's a great guy, but it was. Um, it depended where you sat. And the thing is, I mentioned this in the book. It's like the mat's big, right? It's what is it, eighty tatami, something like that. More, I can't remember. More than that, I think. And you know, in this corner, people are killing each other. In that corner, you have like more, some experienced teachers because like Dochu's uh, Friday night class, you've got like Kato Sensei coming in and all these kind of people coming in to pay their respects and support the dojo. That's on the left-hand side. And some people that practice kind of on the left-hand side and toward the front, that's a different kind of, you know, animal you're coming in, in, in touch with. And all of us crazy monkeys back in the right corner you know, Shikaku, the death corner, we're all by the men's changing room. It used to be like that. It's not like that anymore. But you could sit down and bow in and have a really rough hour of travel. <laughs> More careful. So depending on who you picked. <laughs>
Correct, Amando. <laughs> the, the, the amazing thing is the, the, the mixture. If you actually wanted to train pensioner style, you could. Yep. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It's not like, and it, and it, it's sort of like um, people know what they're getting into. You know, they, they, you knew it once you were there for a while. If you're going at it with one of your, you know, kind of rougher or stronger friends, then that's the way it was going to be. No quarter given, no quarter asked for. Yeah, you would you would feel you'd be appalled if you actually hurt the person. You trained as if you're gonna get them, you know, and they're really trying to get you. That's the way they that's the way they train. It was funny. I was having dinner or yeah, after class, after BJJ and Aikido class in Beijing with a friend, a, a Canadian guy that used to roll in and do the uh, BJJ classes, and he used to do Aikido in Japan. And we met in Beijing. We didn't know each other here, but we have mutual friends. And we go out with a South African friend of ours. And then this Canadian guy is describing the Asakeiko, the morning class, the South African BJJ guy. He's like, you grab your friend, and throw him as hard as you can, like four times in a row. Then he grabs you and throws you, four, you know, four times as hard as you can. And this guy's eyes are getting bigger and bigger. You know, he's just laying on the ground and, and rolling and having a fun with your, you know, a laugh with your mates. And it's still hard, but it's not the same same experience as that at 6 30 in the morning <laughs> on a cold winter in tokyo yeah on mats that are like concrete <laughs> you so know hard, yeah <laughs> yeah so that's actually one of the the things that not many mention but it's possibly one of the biggest problems you have when you come from outside and you start training at, at the home the mats are so hard that it's like falling on right. concrete yeah on concrete and then they're like sandpaper so you know you if don't don't let someone rub your <laughs> let someone rub your face on them you know but um yeah anyway. um going going back to the the, the californian experience when you mm. when you move to japan uh, oh. is there anything that um uh, coming from the from California and Aikido from Furuya Sensei actually helped you because I, I, I heard this, maybe some disadvantages, but something that actually made it easier for you having your past experience. Well, I think he was like a, like a psychological stickler, you know, he was a stickler for like etiquette and all these kinds of things. And that was very helpful. And he was good at putting psychological pressure on you. Right. That some people would say, oh, you're abusing me. No, no, no. It's just it would be not just a lot. We have a lot of teachers that are good at like popping you if you you know do the wrong thing. And that happened to me, too. But he's good. He's very bright. Right. Like too smart, potentially. And he's very good at applying like up to pressure on you like this. And so um, in my work, I noticed when I went to court, especially federal court, you know, what's the difference between God and a federal district court judge who are appointed for life? God doesn't think he is a federal district court judge. In other words, a federal district court judge thinks he's God, right? So I noticed that when I started to go there, Aikido had changed me. I was no longer, it's just like, well, whatever's going to happen. If I take it in the neck and he wants my wallet and puts me in jail, then there I go, you know? And uh, I think when I got to Japan, I wasn't uh, frightened by that kind of thing. The difference, the, the, the otherness or the, the difference of it. I think it can be, you know, unsettling for people, especially Japan can be unsettling because it will have kind of this veneer of seeming Westernness in some respects. So it looks like it ought to be, you think it ought to be a certain way, but it's not working that way at all. Um, I can remember getting there on one of my first trips where suddenly, I forget the teacher's name, he just comes up to me in the morning class and yells at me, he'd seen me before, that this foreigner is leaning against the center post. It's relaxing, it's between classes. And so my Japanese wasn't that good yet. And I'm like, okay, I think I figured it out, you know? Um, but I think that dealing with those kind of ambiguities, pushing yourself out into the deep water, challenging yourself with, you know, things that are uns uncertain circumstances is, is how you grow, you know? Because martial arts is not just a physical component, especially when you, you're talking about confrontations that aren't necessarily in the context of match fighting or ring fighting. It's much more unclear and much more uncertain, you know, if you're walking down the street someplace or uh, or such. And I think that 
Furui Sensei's dojo prepared me for that experience. And I think also that I had sort of very orthodox, very fundamental Aikido, which I think I gained a lot actually by being in Japan for a lot of reasons. Um, uh, and I got, a, I got a different perspective, different aspect of Aikido. The great thing about Hanbu is it used to be like, you know, the teacher is the swordsmith, the tatara, the oven are, is, is the dojo and the method and style of practice. The or and things, that's the students that go inside. And it had this sort of critical mass of students. Every Aikido geek in the world practically was there. And then it had all these different masters that would help could shape you in a different way. And you'd see some aspect of a, of a teacher's technique or of the technique that you hadn't noticed or seen before. Uh, when I got there, of course, uh, Nidai Doshu was still teaching and Arikawa was teaching, Sensei was teaching regularly and so was Tada Sensei and so was Ichihashi Sensei. And so, you know, you got a lot of different perspectives uh, on Aikido. And then the emphasis on Tsuwariwaza and constantly sitting just in life, the cultural aspects of this. My apartment I had like six tatami, you sat on the ground all the time. I walked everywhere. I didn't have the brains to buy a bike for the first year. So I was always walking to the dojo at 0500 or whatever it was. And, um, but those kind of things were, again, you, you know, I to use this, this, uh, now, uh, this metaphor of forging yourself, those were great experiences. In Los Angeles, I had my car just drive to the dojo, you know, to putting your two hours of hard practice. This was something that was more uh, encompassing because of the culture I was living in, I think. And um, I would say that I had been grounded in very orthodox fundamentals to begin with, and that was very helpful. You know, it was it gave me a good base upon which to build. You mentioned already in Asageiko, the morning class, and in your book, you explained the importance of it at the Hombu Dojan. Right in a favorite for thousands of Aikido students from all over the world. Uh, could you elaborate a little about it? Explain for the viewers about the Asageiko. Sure, sure. I think that, you know, at that time too, it's Nidai Doshu, so when he's getting older, right? So people want to go and show the respects, but I think that it's the blueprint it shows the blueprint for what Aikido is. And you're gonna get a broad exposure. So there, a good, a good sampling of the curriculum if you attend five days a week. That's number one, okay? And it's a great place to brush up on your fundamentals. You know, it's also a great way to start the day. It's a personal discipline of getting up every day and going. You're doing something that's inconvenient. And I think if you, if you go, to do anything. If you practice it when it's inconvenient, you'll end up getting as good as you can get at it. You know? So I would say number one, it's kind of the blueprint for, you know, um, Aikikai Aikido. It doesn't mean it's going to cover all the curriculum, but it's going to give you a solid base and exposure to, to all these, um, all, a variety, a healthy variety of the, of the curriculum. I'd also say that, um, this is how the deshi are trained. They go every morning, right? And then for, you know, if you have the time, what I would do is I'd sneak down to the second floor and I'd do the beginner's class because then I could watch Miyamoto since they move slowly with beginners and I could train with beginners and feel how real people move, not Aikido people. Then I'd run back upstairs for eight o'clock and do the eight o'clock class of, you know, a senior teacher who came in to teach. So I would also say that in you know in 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 terms of how you're perceived by others you're perceived as being uh, majime as being serious you're a serious student you know and um you're because you're putting yourself into this sort of inconvenient time and this you know kind of difficult task of getting up every day and you're because they don't know you when you get here right you know any any measure of tolerance they have for me has been because I just put in the bloody hard work. I had a really lovely wife that they all liked. And, um, and you know, I said I married her so people would like me, you know. It's kind of like tying a stake around your neck, your neck and then being around dogs or something like that. So, yeah. And um, in, go ahead. 
<laughs> so I must be good. Look. <laughs> yeah, I know. I must be okay. Well, he's not all bad after all. You know, I guess I can't. You know. So um, I would say that those are the reasons to do it. I think number one, you're showing your sincerity, and that's a huge thing in Japan, right? That you're a sincere person. The second thing is you're a reliable. You're a serious person, even though you might like to joke and have fun, but you're also a serious person. And it also shows a commitment to practice. And I would say also you're getting this, this perspective or a sampling of the techniques from someone who's showing it to you in a very kind of vanilla way. They're not injecting a lot of their personality into it. Okay, there's a continuity between Nidai Doshu, Sandai Doshu, um, you know, current dochu and then his son as well. So I think that that's, that's why I would do that if you, you know, have the time uh, to do it. And um, would you say that uh, Asaga Eiko, the morning class is like uh, Iemoto in action? What? Like the continuity of the tradition in action from yeah, Iemoto. Yeah, no, yeah, I think so too. I think there's that, and I think there's this uh, this uh, aspect of of paying respect to some someone and something. Even if you just did it for a year, and then you decided, well, Asakeko doesn't work for me with my job now, but you've already kind of set the tone of who you are. So yeah, I think that's another way to describe it. Um, but doesn't mean that's what you have to do. I mean, the book says that. The book says find your way, right? And I don't mean to be corny about that. It's just that. That's where I think you have the, the self-expression that everybody's so desperate to do, you know, within the context of how you develop yourself. That's where you find your own self-expression. Fighting to add things and change techniques. I see people that have been doing Aikido for 15 years telling me how they're going to modernize it. You know, I just want to just somebody, you know, it just makes your head explode. <laughs> just like, really? That's all you're doing? Why not cure cancer? <laughs> why aim for that yeah. you know maybe, and, maybe better <laughs> yes yeah well you know it's anyway so that's why i would do morning class i think uh, again back to the the beginning of your experience even though mm. your experience has been a little different from the, the normal one uh, most people that move to japan report having a lot of problems because they want to train first of all but then they discover they have to juggle right the reality of life that means correct pain number one but also you need to support yourself so work and also the, the other very important thing you know you cannot live in a foreign country without mastering the the language so learning right. Japanese um, how how did this uh relate to yeah. how did you manage uh, and any actually uh, any advice for people that want to follow the the same path sure sure no i mean some of it i managed well and some of it i didn't you know i mean looking back now and then i made some of the same mistakes when i ended up in china um but um i would say that i was number one i was lucky i had socked away a bunch of money so i didn't have to worry about money and i maybe i spent more money maybe than wiser people would want to spend but but it, it i had the freedom to train for 15 well, months it's never enough no no yeah, that's true this is true and um i so i i was lucky that first year i didn't have i wasn't married yet you know i took me forever to settle down and um you know, I, I, once the Peter Pan suit got a bit tight, I figured I'd better get married and grow up. But um, anyway, so, so I think that I was really lucky. I wasn't distracted by other things. I didn't have um, a job. I didn't have a wife. I didn't have a girlfriend. I met a girlfriend, but she was living in Korea. That, that came later. And, um, you know, I could really just focus on training. And so I was able to do that for 15 months, but then you're right, then the reality settled in. So I went back to working as a lawyer and I had to strike this balance. The first job, nah, it didn't really work out so well. And then I was lucky again. I, I, I landed a job where they're like, well, we can't afford to pay you. You've got too much experience, blah, blah, blah. Don't worry about it. Just, I don't have to do any sabazangyo. I don't have to do any service overtime. I just have to work from 9.30 to 5 and I'm out of there, right? And then also, 
I had learned this in Los Angeles, that's important where you live and commute to minimize your commute, make that as smooth as possible. And so I had just one, two stops, one change, easy change and two stops to the dojo, leave a bike there. And I could make me a motorcycle sensei's class on Fridays at 5.30 still. So I was able to do Asakeiko or somebody else's evening class any day of the week. So I was able to perpetuate what I had been doing. Um, and I would say that in, in the area of, of learning the language, I'd studied Japanese before I left, but of course that was pretty much useless once I got there because I wasn't using it enough. And, yeah. uh, as always. Yeah. As always. always. Yeah. yeah, and then I, um, I, yeah, I made a mistake. I later, I decided to join a school and I made a mistake what school I joined. Again, now people are more fortunate that the internet is so, you know, um, full of different ways to study online that weren't quite un uh, available yet. I was, I was, um, you know, arrived in sort of the infancy of the internet, you know, the best thing was a monkey scratching its butt and sniffing it and falling out of a tree. That still might be the best thing on the internet, but, but, um, you know, so the, it's a trade-off. Yeah, I had lots of advantages, but there were disadvantages. And I think that getting into the right school I think it's worthwhile to go to Japanese school to give you a little bit more structure. You can also get a visa that way. Um, it's never been easier to come to Japan, you know? And if you're in your twenties, my God, you're gonna be 30 one day. Why not be 30 and have, have lived in Japan? If you're good 30, why not be 40 and having have lived in Japan, right? Um, same thing as you go up, the, go up the ladder. It's just a matter of being able to arrange it. It's never been easier to arrange. And, um, I would say, though, that I made mistakes, as you read in the book when I talked about Japanese language, you know, the story about the NHK guy. And <laughs> that's a true story, though, but my friend that opened the door naked. Give it to us. Give it to us. Well, no, my buddy of mine is a Canadian. We call him the MacGyver of Tokyo, because if you gave him some duct tape, some paper clips and a stapler, he could build an aircraft carrier. This guy is just amazing, right? Every People that are probably on the call know who he is, but they used to check up on you whether or not it's like the TV license in the UK. Okay. And they used to check up on you, whether or not you had a TV and you had to pay this fee. And if you get here as a foreigner, you're not bilingual and you don't understand a bloody thing on Japanese TV, half the foreigners would stuff their television into the closet and go, look, I got no TV. And so my buddy, one day, the guy kept coming back and he's a rather plump fellow, big guy, but kind of, you know, and, uh, he, he answered he answered the door stark naked and just opened the door and said get a shy come on in right and that guy from nhk tv was like a blue uniform streak down the street never came back again and so to my guy i turned to him and i acted like i was trying to get the words i said ah nihongo o tabimasen which means i don't eat japanese language and then he just went like, oh, forget it. It's not worth my time coming back here again. So those kind of things, I don't, I don't know what this, I don't think they come, come around anymore. I'm not sure how, or they're probably much wiser about it. You can speak English to you and say, look, pay the fee, Bob. Well, things have changed. I remember maybe 20 years ago when I first came to Ireland, once I was driving and I forgot my driver's license at home, but I had my mm -hmm. Italian, ID on me, right? It right. Looked completely different from any <laughs> international driver's license. And just to say, <laughs> we were different. I managed to convince the policeman that that, that was the Italian driver's license. And he, <laughs> off you go. <laughs> so, okay, off you go. That's it. Well, work. <laughs> living abroad, one has to improvise from time to time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a yeah. uh, bit of change of subject now. Uh, sure. Talk a bit about um, the founder. Um, mm. Nowadays, the, the Morihei Shiba and this very complex character are experienced mm. in, in the West, especially by the Aikido community with a, a mixture of respect and reverence that uh, sometimes, I have to say often, uh, borders on, it's a big word, but idolatry. 
okay? By idolatry, sure. No. Unfortunately, you get that too. And it's been interesting for, for me and for a lot of other people to know how this uh, relates to the situation in Japan. How does the um, uh, Japanese Aikido community, contemporary uh, Aikido community, mm. it to the uh, figure and the moment, the memory of the founder? Well, yeah, this is, that's a really interesting question. That's a really interesting question. And yeah, I think the idea, the idolatry issue, you know, everybody loves superheroes, you know. There's a reason it's the most, some of the most popular films these days. But, um, uh, and then you have the cultural aspect. I think with Westerners, we can be a bit naive still about things about the Far East, you know, it seems unclear and, you know, mystic to us. And, you know, we, you know, we, we are in, easily enamored with these kinds of things. It's not a criticism, it's just the way it is. I mean, they sometimes feel the same toward us. There's things that are very attractive about our culture and background and history. And, you know, it's just a part of human curiosity, I think. And, and um, we all love to dream and kind of fantasize about things and love adventures and stories. Um, but I think in the case of Japanese, a cultural difference would be that they don't feel the need to express everything, you know, verbally. So there's probably what they think personally, and then there's what they're actually going to say publicly or in a, you know, in a group, unless you get them really pissed and then they might tell you what they really think. That was a good thing, right? And then the next day everybody forgets it. There's in vino veritas. I mean, what can I, what can I teach you a Roman? Um, and uh, they, you know, so it's an interesting idea. I do still come across. I think you don't come across as much nihilism as you do typically in the West these days. Ah, oh, that's bullshit. You know, oh, that's you know, and you don't come across that. Um, and I don't. They think they're afflicted with our narcissism either, which has been growing. I mentioned that in the book, right? You know, in terms of kids and that's a psychological test for narcissism. But, you know, it's like a person who does all these amazing things in their life and then you're suddenly complaining about them and you're like some guy in his mom's basement in his underwear, you know, in your underwear. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> so, um, so I think that's one difference. There are going to be thoughts that they have on their own, you know, and I mean, still venerated, still, you know, respected. And I think that some of the concepts that we like to have very definitively, I mean, you're really seeing this West now where you have these ridiculous dichotomies, these ridiculous sort of bipolar ideas. It's all this way or it's all that way. You know, um, culturally here, people are, are, I think, more adept at dealing with ambiguities and not expressing them all the time. So um, it's not the kind of thing that all of us talk about all the time. I think that, uh, you know, I think to the, and I think to the, to the extent that someone would have reservations or criticisms, they'll often keep it to themselves because they think it would be disrespectful to other people to express that. You have this issue of face, right? I mean, it's, there's big differences in faith between China, Japan, and Korea, too, by the way. And I've learned that firsthand in, in, in uh, you know, how that cultural idea plays out within the actual society. And uh, I would say that on the one hand, in the West, you have a lot of people that, you know, just a guy expressing his opinion. You have a lot of iconoclasts. They want to tear everything down. You know, uh, I mentioned nihilism and narcissism, you know, oh, since they lived in a time, I mean, you can't even recreate. First of all, it's probably difficult to even comprehend what he lived through. Most people's lives are so easy and so convenient now. You know, the notion of doing the things he did is just so beyond, um, you know, your typical Westerner, especially someone younger who's been, you know, uh, immersed in sort of postmodernist, you know, notions. <laughs> pushed by the Frankfurt School. So um, I, I think that, uh, and then again, how does that relate back to your practice? For me, as a, 
as a uh, as an American, I also have British citizenship, but also I have my own tradition. I'm not in the position where I put people on a pedestal. I come out of the Judeo-Christian tradition of the West, and we're taught not to venerate people to the point of idolatry, right? That's the right word, I think. That's definitely the right word. And you see this in other martial arts. You see this with people like, you know, I don't know. You you can pick, even when they're not in Japan. You can, you know, you know see this kind of thing, kind of deify people. And I think you don't need to go that far, but you can still say, hey, look, this person had a, it was an amazing human being, you know, in, in terms of his quest, trying to understand existence and trying to understand um, conflict in human life of which he saw his fair share and understand how he could develop himself. You know, I think if all of us like spend a lot more time trying to take the log out of your own eye to help take the speck out of your brothers or sisters, the world would be a lot better off. There's too much finger wagging and sort of fault finding at everybody around us and not turning it back on our ourselves and try to improve what I do and how I interact in the world and how that enhances the lives of those with whom I interact. Um, so bringing it back to your question, it's not the kind of thing that they really will talk about. Um, although, uh, you know, I've heard people say, look, people, he's not uh, Emperor Palpatine shooting rays out of his fingers and knocking people down. I mean, you know, Sensei was a man like anyone else. He's an incredibly strong man and then an incredibly well-trained person. And in many different respects, not just in martial arts alone. And so it gives, it should be an inspiration for what a human being, how you can take a human being and train them rather than just make an app or a machine that can do the job that, it, that a human being can. I think I'm, I almost sound like Frank Herbert and Dune, you know, but, um, but, you know, that's kind of my take on it. I don't have that much to say specifically on the question of, I've had people express to me and say, oh, you know, he's not tossing people around the room when he's 83 years old. And I've had other people tell me, well, I saw some amazing things that, it was an old man, uh, you know, older gentleman that I just couldn't believe and couldn't get my head around. So I answered your question without answering your question or offending anyone no, no. <laughs> for once. <laughs> you learned the Japanese way. Yeah, it's a first for everything, let me yeah. tell you. Let's stay with the Ueshibas now. Um, let's talk about uh, Nidai Doshu, Ueshiba Kishu. Right. Uh, mm. There's no doubt, in my mind anyway, that he, he his foresight, uh, his understanding that Aikido needed to be modernized. Let's use the, the bad word, the changed, in right. order to succeed as an art that... Uh, was suitable for, could be suitable for the late 20th century society. These actions were decisive really for the success of Aikido and they caused the, basically thanks to him, me and you are talking here on Zoom. 100% correct. So. Uh, he, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No need I do shoe, it disappears in some mountain, some place in some dojo and just on. He could have stayed um, an employee in his company and all of this would have disappeared. Uh, right. Instead, thanks to his um, work, uh, there's millions, there's been millions of people training in Aikido worldwide. Uh, this is one side of the argument. The other side of the argument is that um, whenever we talk about Aikido and especially the, the um, uh, great teachers, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone, back to what we were saying before, everyone points the finger of how great is uh, Morihei Ueshiba. And um, Kishimaru is considered um, like an obscure figure, uh, sometimes right. uh, barely mentioned, uh, especially in re in when you compare him to his father. Uh, a little problem. Right. Don't you think that maybe he was the real O-sensei? We'll change it. Just a second. Yeah, that's okay. That's the extent of my Korean. 
to my daughter. Anyway, no, no, I, I love. Thank you. Um, well, gosh, you know, that's, again, I think a lot of people have a lot of opinions that are a lot of nonsense, right? What's the best thing about the internet? Everybody has an opinion. What's the worst thing about the internet? Everybody has an opinion. And so, uh, you know, that's what I wanted to say about idolatry in Osensei, right? Or deification in Osensei is that to what effect, what effect does that have on me now? You know, I mean, I, 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 and same thing with this. It's like, look, and everyone wants to complain. Anyone can destroy anything. Anyone can tear anything down. I think one of the worst problems we have in the United States is that intellectually, we've been fed all this critical theory. And all you do is criticize and destroy and take things down. And that's why you see destruction of everything. It reminds me of, you know, um, I won't say destroy the four olds. Um, you can Google that yourself. And anyway, um, I think that Kishimoto Sensei in his own right is a great teacher. He's a great man, that's for sure. I mean, I met him and he's one of the most dignified human beings I've ever been around, you know? And um, he also, he developed so many of the teachers that took Aikido Global, you know? He knew how to make a, he knew how to make a student. He knew how to make a teacher. You know, there's no question that Sensei is this, this, you know, complex, amazing, you know, um, it's, it's, it's almost hard to describe him in so many ways, right? I mean, how can any of us even relate to it? Because he have not done all the things he's done, you know, it's to articulate it is incredibly difficult, but it's a sort of burst of creativity. And then you have someone else that comes along and kind of has to nurture it and grow it and uh, sustain it and fo focus it in a way. And I, you know, there's a lot of historical things that are going on at this time too, right? And you have World War War and all this kind of thing. And then you're right, you have to think about, I would use the word accessibility rather than modernization. Because mm -hmm. the world wasn't all that uh, modern at that point yet. I mean, it's ways we can blow each other up, sure. But I would say make it accessible and make it accessible to non-Japanese, non-East Asians. I tend to use the word East Asian because Asian's a big place. Russians are Asians and Indians are Asians and Pakistanis are Asians and from all over the place, right? So I think that um, you're correct in the fact and the idea that uh, he's the reason that we're doing this. And I think it's okay. You don't have to be another creative genius. We've had the creative genius. We've had the spark of, of ingenuity. Okay, it's like planting the, the, person, the person that creates and plants the seed, you know, and Doshu, Nida Doshu comes along and, you know, he, he then nurtures it. You know, I walked through uh, Shinjuku Park recently, you know, and, and there's this view of there's the pond and the, the, the sakura and the other blossoms and things, but then they build a pavilion that gives you like the proper, perfect view with which to see it. And in a way, I think Kishimoto Sensei brought it all into focus for people. It doesn't matter if you know, see the strongest, wait, wait a second. I mean, I used to hear this in a BJJ dojo I was in. I won't say which, which one. Obviously it wasn't Roger, <laughs> wasn't Roger Gracie's, but, but um, a, a younger student complained he thought he could beat one of the black belts. So how does he have a black belt? And I'm like, no, it doesn't work like that, right? It doesn't really work like that. And it, and um, my feeling is that that you've 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 hit the you hit the nail exactly on the head. That he's really taken this thing and nurtured it and grown it into something that's accessible for more people to do. And you know, if the objective is to maximize participation, maximize benefit to society then what he did with the original, you know, kind of creative spirit, the creative, um, you know, kind of life force of it is in its own way commendable. It doesn't have to be identical to his father. You don't have to compare him to his father, you know, and people want to criticize Nidai Doshu. Why? You wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't for him, as you because point he, out. You mentioned earlier the fact that most people love superheroes, and there's no doubt uh, in my mind that Morihei was our superhero. He right. uh, doesn't look totally right like that because he has been 
as you just totally doing a different kind of work that is possibly even more important than what the superhero does uh, because without it we wouldn't have anything you know but it's not it doesn't appeal the imagination of people maybe we should start calling uh, uh, Kishimaru Doshi or Olsen say the second so maybe more people <laughs> you know I don't, I, I, I don't know but I just think hey, what does it matter how does it affect your practice I mean that's the other thing it's like you know one more thing to argue about let me tell you when you get on I'm not there yet but I've been around people that have been when you get on your deathbed you're not going to go bad I wish I had one last discussion about whether or not you know oh sensei could do this or that I, mean, I used to joke with a uh, friend I said you know how many how many aikidoka does it take to change a light bulb just one and all the rest to tell you how sensei did it <laughs> and then dear stan pranin to tell me that and only make a, and make a face they really knew how also and make a facebook post about it right. yeah that's that well then i said an old dear stan pranin to tell me that only saito sensei really knew how and so you know at the end of the day this doesn't affect you it's just like you know get this kind of silly nonsense of whether spider-man can beat underdog in a fight out of your head because i got news for you they're both fictional <laughs> I don't want to, spoiler alert. No, no, no. They're fake. <laughs> okay. Another interesting topic. Uh, everyone loves to get promoted. No, that's, yeah. uh, that's endemic. And yes, are gradings uh, and rank a necessary evil in Aikido? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. I always say, someone asked me one year why I got promoted. And I said, that year, and I said, because I have my mother's Germanic gift with people. So <laughs> I'm the wrong person to ask about how to get promoted, believe me. Yeah. And uh, I've had to, I have to wrest the certificate out of their hands before they get close enough to the shredder. Um, I think that, look, again, again, you've got people like, you know, you've got people that just want to tear everything down. I get it. Look, I'm where I am. And there's, a, there's I mean, I promised one of my students I wouldn't do anything controversial, so I won't. But in other countries in the world, definitely not in East Asia, there are countries where they have dojos that they call like a McDojo or they call a, I call them HP Dojo because they have a printing machine that just spews out the certificates. HP printer, right? And I don't think Aikikai's gotten that bad yet, but um, I do remember Furuya Sensei told me that at Humble Dojo, and there's a difference between like, if you're a Humble Dojo student when you get promoted and if you're someplace else, that's for, sh for sure. Not, not one, to, not, yeah, not zero to four, okay? And he, Furuya Sensei told me it used to be really hard to get fourth on at Humble, really hard, okay, back in the day. And I was in Humble Dojo when somebody failed three times three times and the guy went oh you know he wouldn't complain you're racist and i said no hey come here man i got some news for you it's not that good <laughs> oh Fred, it's not i got news for you not them <laughs> you but here's the good part <laughs> if you practice harder you can fix it so um i think also again in the west we're struggling a lot with the uh kind of dominance hierarchies tear them all down they're all bad you know they're not necessarily. I think that promotions can provide a structure and the structure can provide safety and sort of it provides, um, you know, uh, a, a sense of a sense of uh, nurturing those that are behind you. It depends who you get. Right. And one of the worst problems is someone that kind of gets a promotion because they've taken care of the bookkeeping and gotten, you know, the, the student applications done suddenly gets their fifth on and they think that they're really now they think they're you know iron man yeah. so that that is a problem but and what do we do about it i still think that maybe it's become a bit too easy and you know after a while it has no meaning i mean i've seen people in countries where they're getting promoted to fifth on in 18 years they never had a teacher before i mean they had a teacher they visited once a year in japan for a week and that person came to their country for a weekend on a year i mean there there are there are exceptions to the rules there are people that catch it on catch on like that and 
Then on the other hand, the flip side is you're trying to build a structure and you're trying to build a community and you're trying to do all these things. I think on a personal level, it's good for, um, for having milestones. I noticed doing BJJ, they give you the stripe on the belt. Everybody's so happy about that. You know, it's, oh, I got a cookie, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. and uh, it's, it's human nature. And um, so I think on the one hand, you should still have them. On the other hand, we should maybe make it, and I don't know if you can go back now, the genie's out of the bottle, you know, um, maybe the gradings have become a bit too easy. Past a certain level, you know, I, after like fourth on, I don't maybe even before that. I mean, and it's, it's, this is another problem we're having is that um, equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome. Okay. Equality of outcome is not guaranteed in life. And it's a very boring life. If you decide, if you decide to orient your society in that regard, I can go to Michael Jordan's basketball camp. In my case, I went to John Wooden's, but jo Michael Jordan's basketball camp from now till the cows come home, if I was 18 years old, and it's not going to make me Michael Jordan. Okay. And that's not a bad thing. If you go look, speaking of John Wooden, if you, anybody who's teaching, coachwooden.com, go study him. Okay. He was almost teaching basketball like it was, a, like it was an Eastern martial art. Definition of success is an incredible, an, an incredible thing to understand in your own life. And basically, it's peace of mind of knowing that, that you've sort of done the best under the circumstances, your utmost under the circumstances with your abilities, what you were given, you know, and the situation in life. That's all you can do, you know. Um, so rounding back, I think we've seen this issue of, of you know, the gradings becoming easier in all martial arts as they were commercialized. You know, we saw this with Taekwondo. You've seen this even in BJJ. You know, it used to be super hard to get a blue belt and it became easier and easier and easier. You know, Aikido has been no different in that regard. I think particularly the, the problem, or the, not the problem, the challenge with Aikido is how do you maintain standards when there's no competition? You know, but then again, we get back to this sort of Bible of the fittest attitude and this utilitarian attitude that if I can't win the match, that means I'm not the best or the best teacher. Well, that's not necessarily true. Some of the people that are the best teachers aren't really, you know, that gifted. And oftentimes it's because they weren't so gifted that they had to sort of dig in deeper and study harder and then convey that to, to another person in, in a way that can develop them. I think there's some valid criticism there that, you know, perhaps we should make it a bit more challenging for people. And that if people are worried about numbers declining and things like this, you know, um, I don't, don't think you're going to help the art by just making it easier and easier and easier and easier. No. No, no. Because you are, Go ahead. You're, actually, uh, you're actually developing an inverted pyramid, you know? Correct. It used to be, Correct. It used to be like this, no? It did. Uh, in my days, uh, when I started Aikido at uh, the beginning of the 70s, um, in Italy, there was two resin uh, shihans, and they had well. Initially, they had a fifth dan, and they got promoted to sixth dan. Uh, right. Plenty, tons of people training, tons. Okay, I remember when my dad got the third dan. It was like wow. Okay, now everyone is yeah. Dan. There's oh. no, I don't I don't even know how many seven dans we got. But the, the, the base actually shrunk. The, there's a, a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, high ranked practitioners. Yeah. That you would expect that this would mean that the base also expanded. That didn't happen. That didn't. No, that's, 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 you know, that's a problem. Yeah. You know, and I've seen it. I mean, look, I've been in a country where they're trying to develop a Aikido community and, and develop, a, you know, a kind of, um, how, okay, you're, you're, you're trying to develop a, an Aikido culture or Aikido community or, you know, enthusiasts. And, you know, it was very challenging for people at first. It's sort of, you know, in Beijing, it started in 2002. They had a guy that started this group and, and, um, who taught him? Nobody, you know. And then uh, no, actually another guy is a Russian friend of mine. It's quite a good boxer. He, he's out of China now, but he he actually joined my dojo later. Um, he's he knew another kind of offshoot of Aikido, and he was starting to teach too. 
but then within three years, people got black belts. And I don't think that helped anybody. I struggle with this with my own students now. I tell them, no, you're not getting promoted that fast. Sorry. You want it, you want that? Go to one of the other places, mm. you know. And um, and I and think people that, actually do. A lot of people Yeah, are, no, they do. And that, that means they don't belong where I'm where I am. And then, you know, then uh, I can send like one of my Ken Shuse to any seminar there and they won't practice with him, you know, because a guy's already got like a fourth on or yeah, I mean, they think they even have given two fifth dons now, it just blows your mind. And um, and they won't go near him because they, they, you know, it, but culture works into it and all this kind of thing. It has nothing to do with liking or disliking a place. I just, I teach, we can get to China later, but I teach a certain way there out of respect. I don't teach it, I'm not babying them. I tell them this all the time. I said, they said, oh, William Patrick Hun Guban, right? He's old fashioned or stiff or rigid. I said, I'm doing this because Chinese people can do anything like anybody else, maybe better. You don't have to be baby. You don't need me to come here and go there, there, there. Here's another promotion. This is nonsense. You know, I don't want it to all be a big joke. I want some people to be, you know, capable and and skilled and you know why not and so when they hear that a lot of them will go oh i like that oh that makes sense you know and so those are the ones i want to stay so i'm you know i'm getting back i've run i've run my what i'm running and i've been a little more flexible as far as dojos outside of beijing but you know all in due time it's uh it's it's a process and and in my own dojo though i've been strict you know and i think they've gotten better and stronger and you know when one of them comes here and someone uh, shihan says he's not bad as a japanese that's a high praise so you know I, if i can create two or three people like that and then disappear into the distance you're know, great that's good my little gift back to, to china which is providing me with a lot of um really great times and experiences there so Think you're on to something and we have to come up with a solution for this you can't just keep making it easy making it easier and easier and easier and easier it's not going to bring more people on the mat it's not there's no doubt wait, wait, wait. In, in my, there's no doubt that in the dojo situation this works and why is that because the teacher the person that is in charge is actually in charge well unless it's uh, we're talking about correct yeah uh be as dojo you know so right uh, the problem is that when you move from the dojo or the small organization situation to the larger organization then the commercial logic takes over because they have to compete you know it's, a, it's the usual story they totally need, they need to have instructors on the ground uh, they, they cannot say it's hard to advertise yourself uh, saying yes we're brilliant but our teachers are only third down while the other guy next door is six down you know so oh, no no wait believe me i'm at the place where i'm living in a place where if you take the test and you pass the test you know whatever it is the gaokao you know the test to go to university then you're in right i mean that's the whole from that culture it was spread to korea and to japan and you know, they have a they have a cultural debt to, to um, the origination of that. But so I, I get it. And and the other question it is, though, if it's a non-competitive martial art, do you need it at all? I would say that on the one hand, yes, you do, because I think the hierarchy has benefits in and of itself. I think there's the notion of sort of milestones in in practice is good for students. I think that yeah, ideally in some kind of pure purist kind of way. No, we don't need it at all. It's just, you know, all train, you know, just for the sake of training. But I think it has enough benefit that um, it's worthwhile. How you sort out the problem, I'm not sure. And what you said is completely accurate. When you expand it to the bigger group, you end up running into money and then you run into empire building. You know, people, teachers get competitive and they want to, you want to, you know, in what, what's going on right now in, in China with me, I just had two different cities contact me again about going in. It's been, we can talk about this later because it's been quite the, quite the process. But um, uh, in one, 
the gents just talking too much about money. So I'll probably end up staying. I've lived in Asia a long time. My wife, Korean American, she would say to me, you can't talk to white people anymore. They don't understand you. <laughs> You're too indirect. So I, I, I'll say, ah, oh, you know, I'm, I'm just not the right person to help you realize your dreams. I don't think I could, I could support you properly, you know, rather than what I would say if I was just using the old Yankee doodle kind of way of talking, you know, back in the day <laughs> or my Scottish way of talking yeah. might be different. Yeah. So, um, but that's just me. Again, it gets back to the book. That's my way. I, you know, you do whatever you want, you know, and the thing that's funny in terms of worrying about what other people are doing, if this experience you're going through right now is just a, a bunch of electronic, you know, bleeps and bloops and charges and, uh, you know, in a carbon-based life form, it's some massive accident, then what the hell does it care? It's just one monkey telling another monkey what he thinks is a bunch of monkeys' ideas that they made up. Doesn't, doesn't make any difference, right? Justice or this or that. I mean, who cares? It's meaningless. The world's going to drift away as a snowball one day when the sun burns out. Okay? If it means something more than that, then, you know, and I'm not saying what that something else, something more is. Well, then, you know, maybe these ideas, these, these notions and ideas are important. But I don't have the answer to what it is. I've just done what I've done, okay? And I, but then again, I, I've had to make compromises. It's just, and you, we, I, I think Fruit Sense is up in the sky someplace laughing at me, you know, because I, I see how it happens. Yeah, I suppose the only thing we can do uh, individually is to do things with integrity. That's all. And, uh, and it doesn't matter if other people do differently. As you said, uh, in the end, doesn't really change anything right i still when japanese asked me what don william on nandan this guy I said oki jodan which means i'm a big joke so jodan is joke in japanese <laughs> anyway it's it's yeah it's a it's it's an experience i had a friend the other day some i you know practicing with a middle-aged lady and she's talking to my friend after class and and my friend says He's got quite good Japanese. She's like, oh my God, I couldn't move him or whatever. And he looks at her and he goes, this guy's like Rokunan Shihan. What do you think you can? You know, and then I'm, this is another thing. We can talk about this later, but I don't think people know what they're doing in class. I didn't say that out loud. <laughs> Wait for the hate mail. <laughs> but I think that, I think people don't realize what they're doing. And some of the criticism of Aikido is being, you know, we'll get to that, I, I think, maybe, too, um, is valid. You know, I'm not sure people fully understand what they're actually doing in their training. And this idea of, of moving people and whether or not it worked or not. We were talking about people. that uh, recently. I was in a different call with Chris Lee, and uh, we agreed, like many others, that fundamentally, most people training have no idea what they're doing and what mm. doing it for <laughs> so yeah, i've never met chris he has some interesting ideas i hope we are paths cross at some point so, so. That a lot of the problems that as a community we were experiencing are probably among other things due to the fact that uh, uh, sure. are, and our objectives are not really that well defined and so it, it is actually difficult to uh, to deal with any problems uh, come out of that. And same with this, you know, the, the um, talk about your your own on, uh, on training. And I, I know it's quite different and I, I find it interesting because in, in a time when the Aikido practice is getting, we would say watered down a little to make it more accessible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, the time when the community in its entirety is uh, criticized because we're we're not dealing well with other styles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you are actually you have experiences in that go exactly in the direction. You taught Aikido in uh, MMA schools. You have exchange experiences with uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu teachers. I had a good look at your YouTube channel. Uh, by the way, oh. Aikido applied. So if you, if you're curious, people go and have a look. 
And all of this, it's quite in counter tendance with uh, the watering down of the art. It's actually- uh, Oh, thank you. In the, the, what you're doing. And so my question is this, uh, in your opinion, does uh, traditional Aikido, does it include all that is necessary to um, mm. fulfill its objectives as a, as a Budo? I mean, not, not, we can discuss what is Aikido today, if it's Budo or not Budo, but right there. Uh, or does it need the, to be evolved? Because in, in the meantime, a lot of things have happened, a new sports combat uh, have emerged. That, so with, what, what's your take on this? Um, tradition or innovation? Well, I think that fundamentally people need to understand what it is at the start. And I think that, you know, somebody's made a, somebody's made an entire internet presence on being really bad <laughs> at Aikido and having misconceptions about it from the start. It's quite funny. I mean, to see someone trying to, to, to say <laughs> they're lousy and then making a, you know, kind of a, a um, entertainment channel out of it. It's a bit interesting, but I think people have misconceptions about what it is at the start. And I think that Principally, you know, uh, O-sensei is looking at it from what I've read and discussion with people and meeting students of his. And from then, you, you know, one thing people forget about Ichimaru sensei and O-sensei is that's his son. It's not like they're not going to have any conversations about it, right? It's not like he's going to say, hey, you know, <laughs> they're having breakfast, they have the natto and the rice or whatever and the pickles. You know, what you're doing was total, you know what I mean? It's... Don't do that. Is, people, you know, <laughs> blood is thicker than water, and people forget this, yes. which I'm, you know, amazed at. But um, yeah, just after. Okay, my daughter. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, what were we talking about? Yeah, no. Um, I just think that people, you know, it's like they get frustrated immediately. I look at Aikido like a piano, or maybe it's even more complex. Maybe it's the a pipe organ. You not, not only do you have to use your hands, you have to use your bloody feet, right? And then pull levers and all kinds of things. It's a very complicated and, and in a good way and technical martial art that I also think requires the develop of, I mean, people use the term internal strength, but I would say other parts of your body other than your major muscle groups, your fascia, your tendon, your ligament, okay? you know ex expanding and extending your joint mobility and then coordination of movement with breath if you want to get back to what aikido was what it is you know you use the word aikido it's like this giant tent and then within within inside that inside that tent are all these different expressions of it it's like what we talked about about the mat at humble dojo where you know, you have all these different people doing different things. I talked, I wrote about that in the book and they're all doing it on the mat at the same time, you know? And I use the analogy that it's like surfing, okay? I can take you to Waikiki and it's really easy and you've got a 12 foot board and away you go, right? But I can take you to Mavericks in Half Moon Bay and not only will the waves kill you, but the sharks will eat you too. So it's different. It's not, the you know, it's still surfing. It's all surfing, but it's not quite the same thing. And I think that, what pe the mistake people make, because you're getting into the, the, the first step they make is what is Aikido? I personally think it is the drink, the as intensively, as intensive as you can bear it, drilling in martial arts techniques to develop you as a human being, body, mind, and spirit. That's what I think, and what I can gather is his original broad intention. And yet it still has this oyowaza, this applied technique issue, because, you know, that, that seems to be an aim, this idea of making it work or getting it right. Now, I think that there's merit in pursuing this kind of utility issue in practice, because it makes you aim for a result and makes you aim for a kind of perfection. Otherwise, it's just what I call like Aiki Undo, just a sports one, two, three, four, right? You know, and I say, I always say there's, 
there's Aiki Budo, right? Budo, and that that that's getting smaller. Then you have Aiki Undo, which is people just practice really fast and throw each other and jump around and everything. And then you've got Aiki Cosplay, which is sort of part of like a philosophy lesson in Japanese clothes. And, you know, then go out for beers. Um, and, and that'll get me in trouble, that point of view. <laughs> and so anyway, um, so you have this first issue of what is it? And that definition of what is it can still include this sort of subset, right? Of, of, of oyawaza, of applied technique. And I think that people have not investigated. Number one, most of them that are trying to apply it have not grounded themselves sufficiently in the fundamentals. Number two, they haven't developed a proper aiki body. One that's more like a coiled snake rather than just rigid iron, you know? You see a lot, I know a lot of guys that do a lot of weapons and stuff. When I look at their aikido, I'm like, just, their, just with their arms, you know? Especially in the West, when you're built very powerfully here, there's a tendency to just want to push. I see Francesco's picture up here. Francesco, I showed him today something that, you know, that, that how he's using his shoulder rather than generating power from the feet, from the floor up. And uh, so it's, again, we get back to this cultural issue of, okay, it's got to be black and white. It's got to be this way or that way. It's got to be on or off. It's binary ideas, the tiny prison of binary ideas, right? And so, you know, it is all these things at the same time. And I think there's lots of different expressions of what Aikido is. And the people that are doing Aikido, just this sort of happy, clappy Aikido, they love it. Let them go do it. That's great. Is what's their ability to defend themselves? Now, when I say that, you've got to divide that into two parts too. One is match fighting and sports fighting. And I deal with this in the book, I'm an Aikido Keiko in an MMA world. And then I talk about um, wrestling with Aikido, Aikido de Grande Iru, and um, which isn't wrestling with Aikido. It's like struggling mentally with Aikido. And so you have to divide it up into kind of self-defense paradigm and then into uh, you know, the match fighting paradigm. And can you take Aikido techniques and could you use Aikido as a base upon which to then go participate in the sport of MMA? Of course. Is that the highest best use of uh, O-sensei's art of peace? Probably not, but you know, maybe, maybe we need someone to go do that, right? Um, and I mean, you see techniques in it for sure. And you see people do it. And I, 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 predict in, I predicted in my book and ultimately people would try to mine it for things that they could add. And I would say that people also don't study deeply enough when it comes to application. Okay, so let's say we have this main thing that everybody's doing and that's the developing of yourself as a human being. And that's great. What a wonderful thing to do for all of society and all of um, you know, uh, humanity. And I get it, there's no contest in Aikido, but then at the same time, can I take that? And if I have a real confrontation, I unfortunately have had actual confrontations before. And like you said, I've taught in different contexts. I have witnesses that have seen them. So it's not like I'm making spin in a spin in a story. Um, yeah, of course you can. Of course you can. And and um, I think that you start by building fundamentals, but fundamentals are boring. People get bored with that and they want to go on to something else, especially the mentality now with an iPhone and an app and I can Google it and I can do this. And then you watch a YouTube video and you can't feel it. You can't see the, the power of this person. You don't know what it's like. I've had people the first time they grab my wrist or you know people, they grab you and you, and you expand your wrist with like a Koki with like your breath and your, you know how to use your, all the meat in your body, not just the major muscles. And people freak out. They go, what the hell? You know, what's that? You know, and I, maybe there's a marketing issue in that. And I think that I said this in the book. I mean, you know, it's like, what's, you know, Elvis Costello, what's so funny about peace, and un peace love, and understanding? You know, I think there's, the world is full of nihilistic jerks and narcissists these days, unfortunately. I think we all have that internal struggle, and you should direct yourself away from that. I think that's a, very uh, unfulfilled existence and you should you should 
pull your mind away from these things. Concentrate on things that are, that are beautiful and inspiring and helpful and constructive. You're going to live a lot better, more satisfying life if you do that. And if you're constantly tearing things apart all the time, doubting everything, you know. Um, so I think that, can you add things to Aikido? Sure. Does it, have I cross-trained? Yep. Did it help me? Sure. Did I try to go use Aikido in them? No, I just did what they did. I just did what they did to learn what they did. I like being a beginner again. I like that a lot. And, um, but like I did Nawaza. And so I like to feel, experience the pressure of someone on top of me. You know? Can you apply principles? Sure. Eventually, sure. Did it improve my chemi? Yeah, it did. And, um, you know, nobody, though, laughed at my class and said, I, a lot of people say, that looks too dangerous. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I, don't like getting, I don't like getting slammed on the ground like that, right? Um, but I think we can't lose sight of this bigger thing that Aikido is and this bigger objective of its contribution to uh, culture and, and human conflict. It still is that. So it's, 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 again, people dealing with these dichotomies, they want it just to be resolved they want it to be all one way or all the other way and um you want to make noise well there's that too yeah there's that too you know and like i said what's so funny about peace love and understanding there are people that don't like and there are forces in the world that don't like the you know oh sensei's message they don't like that you know and um i think that that we're all that message is also running counter to human nature you know i was raised a calvinist i'm people are no damn good you know i <laughs> but have, yeah just simplify john calvin that's it you don't have to read the books now <laughs> um it, but they have great capacity to do good and i think aikido in a way that the, just the typical katakeiko has a way of developing that in human beings that you know because look real martial artists you should develop compassion as well it's nice to be strong but you need to develop other things you know i mean in all martial arts you've got you know uh developing your body taiku you have developing your mind you know chiku and you've got kiku your energy or your strength toku iku your ethics i think aikido is particularly good at that the ethics of just destroying and uh Shiki no Kanryo, which is common sense. You know, like I'm on the mat and it's the middle of class. And I say, point at something and say, hand me that. And there's a banana and there's a tanto. I probably don't want the banana. But if I, if it's after class and people are having a, a drink on the mat, they shouldn't, but they are. And I say, hand me that. And he might, might, might want to eat the banana after class, right? You know, and then Kan or Chokan, which in, it's interesting. The Chinese called Diliogan, you know, six, Diliogan which means like a sixth sense. But actually, I think the Japanese word, the way they look at it, it's like perception, your ability to perceive a thing. And I, if I'm just doing, I never learned any of that in some of the competitive martial arts I've done or dabbled in. And, you know, that Aikido has a, a message of human development, which should be principal and primary, I think. And then after that, we do need to develop some people that are a bit muki muki, a bit muscly, you know, a bit, you know, have some some vim and vigor. You know, I, I think that's important. Um, but not everybody has to do that. And it's okay not to do that. And it's okay not to be able to do that. Right? It's okay if you're not Michael Jordan and you still love basketball. It's okay if you if you go to an eighth graders game and it's all played below the rim. You know, it's still basketball. Yes. So, I mean, I don't know if any of this makes any sense, but I think that my, my stance has been, as you noticed from my channel, I'm not trying to add things to it. Like I've got to add boxing. It may help me because here's the thing is it, for example, Shomanuchi, I had someone say to me the other night, oh, that's completely useless. I said, yeah, listen, I have a friend in Beijing. He was doing BJJ with me, big kid, Texas, pitched at Texas A&M. So he's, he's, He's first division uh, collegiate athlete, okay? I knew some of them and God just went Shazam and they're just, you know, amazing physical specimens. And this guy's like that. 
goes to a bike stand in Beijing, gets in an altercation with the guy running the bike stand. He's probably had too many drinks and a bad argument with his wife. Guy comes out of the bike stand with a hammer, starts swinging it at my friend. My friend has done Muay Thai and he's done BJJ. To get his hand and his arm broken. Eventually, you know, he, he um, lucky he didn't end up in lucky he didn't end up in jail, but um, uh, and he's lucky he didn't get hit in a worse place. So there you go. There's the typical movement that someone's using at a very simple level. Yeah, there's much more complex ways to hold weapons, but as a fundamental pedagogical starting point. It's a wonderful way to teach principles. It's a way to develop the nage. It's a way to develop the uke. And eventually, you take those principles and notions of my eye, understandings of lines of attack and angles of deflection that you've learned from weapons, particularly, and you apply that to different sorts of striking. It's not that complicated. You know, but nobody's doing it. I mean, some people are doing it. That's not fair. I know some people are doing it and probably doing it better than me. Um, but in Beijing, it was just this experiment I had after all this in Aikido applied. I just this experiment I had, and unfortunately, it got derailed a bit because of um, because of COVID. And um, I'll get back to making proper content. I mean, Japan's been a pretty soft lockdown, but I have UK available to me here, and um, we're going to start. I think a small class here, kind of a study group at a dojo and do that after class. So these are things that people can do after or as a special class, you know, um, to add on to what you, the main stock of Aikido, you know? And I think that when someone says, I do Aikido, to me, that's like someone saying that I'm a Christian or I'm a Jew or I'm a Muslim. It could mean anything. It, it's, it's a big tent. Within that word are all kinds of different expressions of it. And rather than saying, Look, if you want to learn Nawaza, go study a Nawaza system. You know, but if and if you want to study the spacing and timing of a striking system, just go study that system a little bit. You don't have to do that system's techniques back to it. You can adapt things because it's really all the same after a while. You know, a strike, a kick, it's all all kind of becomes very similar. So I would think one of the great things about Aikido is the Aikido body, the Aiki body, right? I mean, I have a lot of friends that have done, for example, a lot of Neiwaza, but they, their back is overdeveloped, you know, they're, they're lats and they don't really move well on their feet. And I think that, um, that Aikido as a base for then learning other martial arts is a tremendous thing. I think it's a it's it's a tremendous thing and 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 ukemi right which is really not capitulation at its lowest level it's capitulation but I know Chiba Sensei has written a great piece about it being kind of the art of recovery or the art of survival you can find it on the internet and um, I was lucky enough to be able to be in his dojo in London for a while and met a lot of great people there and still have a, a great senpai up north Mike Flynn so um I think that ukemi is something that people don't fully understand. And that they're, when you're in practice and you're practicing with someone, it's like me, I practiced with this middle-aged lady the other day. What am I gonna do? Just go grab her and lock her up or hit her so hard I break her arm? This is ridiculous. I'm just giving her enough, enough of a feeling and pressure that she can train and make it a little bit difficult for her. And now she may misunderstand that, that I'm resisting her because it's more difficult to move me than someone else, but I'm actually doing her a favor. I'm actually helping her. I'm not just going, you know, uh, this sort of pretty capitulation. I wrote a note to my students in, in all of China recently about this, about how you know, the lowest level of Aikido is just sort of this, you know, Situation. I know someone that got injured recently because he thought the teacher was going to do a technique and then, you know, he zigged when the teacher zagged and basically he jumped when he shouldn't have and now he's buggered his shoulder. So that's really his mistake. So does that make sense? I think maybe I am going in the other direction. I tend not to run with the herd so much, you know. Um, uh, you know I guess when, when it makes sense, but I'm, and I'm, I'm, I question I see people disregarding things they don't fully understand. I see people 
And also because it's convenient, especially the word evolve. Okay, now you're going to get to one of my, not a pet peeve, but to me, that's like, hey, man, don't make me do anything that I really don't want to do and just let me, you know, do what I like. That's it. You know, <laughs> yeah, I think that's pretty much it. You know, the, the great John Wooden said that um, to, prog to progress, you must change, but not all change is progress. So, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Now, William, you mentioned a couple of times the Aiki body and the way mm. you developed the, the Aiki body. Now there's a, a new term going on or the, the internal power training, right. et cetera. Uh, this internal training it's actually been out there for quite a while because we yep. have historic uh, senseis like uh, uh, Tohei sensei or Tada sensei that have developed uh, systems since the, 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 the 70s actually. Um, at the uh, Aikigai, Aikigai Hombu Dojo, this is still not really a matter for um, discussion or not openly anyways how yeah i think the focus is on the focus again is on more basic fundamentals but you can feel it in some people and i would say some keiko are are more predisposed or disposed to being utilized by you to work on some of those concepts it's always available but i think it's in some classes because the way their structure or the teacher's waza or the teacher's focus it's a little easier to, to work on but is it again it's not it's not overtly spoken of and again we struggle with the idea of, hey how come it's not up front man how come you haven't mechanized the whole thing for me how come it's not systematized how come i don't have an app and i can just you see what i mean and it's it's so it's you still run into this sort of cultural issue and then also i'd say that you're sort of bowling if you want a cricket reference or pitching but nobody understands crickets so we'll stick with baseball um you you're pitching down the <laughs> i live next to lords i still don't get it um you're pitching down the middle at about 70 miles an hour 80 miles an hour you're not throwing fastballs you know so it's it's being pitched at a at the broadest audience possible you know so if i start talking about these things but I interrupted you before you even finished your question, which is a lawyer's habit, you know. I <laughs> well, no, uh, just I, I was interested in knowing if you actually have some kind of uh, training regime in, in that sense, or, or oh, I do. I mean, you see small aspects of it. I posted a video where I didn't in my physical and sort of breathing training. It's not all of it by any stretch, and it's it done. In, it's not done in the order that I do it. I posted two videos about that, but but. Uh, it's this is an interesting question because I've been lucky in a couple ways. Again, uh, you know, unlucky in plenty of ways. If you have some time, I could after the call we could go on about that for for a while and have a couple of drinks. But I've been lucky in Aikido in a number of ways, and uh, uh, like being in LA, getting to go to Japan, uh, meeting some great senpai in Japan. Now then, cultivating a senpai in the UK. Then recently, about. 15 years ago, maybe more, I started to experience my, my own Aikido in a way where I started to understand how I was generating power and where I was generating power from. I came, became much more conscious about this. And then I stumbled across, I was interested in sports medicine. And look, if I had to go, I went to UCLA. If I could do it again, I'd have been an East Asian studies major and a kinesiology major. But, you know, youth is wasted on the young. So, um, I started to study like the fascia system, right? And then I had some other experiences in, uh, in training and in, 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 in even in Newaza, I have a friend who does like, he's a Shihan friend of mine and he held me down in, um, in Beijing. Uh, so he's side control. And he only, he barely weighs 60 kilos. My God, the guy felt like he was 500 kilos, phenomenal. And, um, uh, you know, so I, I had this thing I was experiencing in my own training. And then, and I began studying it, because, you know, how do you study martial arts? It's a gaku jutsu do, right? You know, so it's study, technique, way. 
It's the three big characters you're supposed to be keeping in mind when you're studying any martial art. And then all of a sudden I meet somebody and we kind of become friends and, you know, a older guy has been doing Aikido and Kobudo for a long time and just hit it off. And then he's articulating for me, you know, ultimately all martial arts is experiential. It's not conceptual. I can talk about it all day long and you're not going to understand it. Right. You know, how big was the wave? It was so big. It was going to kill me. Wow. I was walking on the moon. Oh, it was great. You know, it just, it's, you had to be there. You have to experience it, right? But he was able in a way to articulate for me, look, this is where you're, what you're experiencing and this is where you kind of can take it to a next level. So I showed Francesco a few things today that about how I use the Joe or how I practice Bolkan and how I'm, you know, I'm not, don't get caught up in this or that kata. It's a tool for me to develop my body. That's it. And to understand principles. Now, kata are helpful for that sometime, but my solo training. So I have solo training I do with weapons. I have solo training I do with some other devices. One that a friend showed me. Uh, it's a awkward kind of long staff and a bit difficult to manipulate. And then I was experimenting with this with weights. One of the interesting things about Fluid Sensei is before he became obese was he was actually quite fit like a 28 inch waist and a 44 coat. And it was like a V, he used to go down and lift at Venice Beach and he knew Schwarzenegger. And he told me the most amazing thing about that guy, he said, I'm gonna be Mr. Universe. And then he was Mr. Universe, right? And then he went, you know, I'm going to be a movie star. I'm going to go into politics. And this is before he had, was really that popular in the movies and before he had been governor of California. Darn if he didn't do it. but. I, this is one thing that Furiya Sensei has that I covet. Um, come on, David Ito, cough it up. If he has notes that he did about his weightlifting and how, what he, how he used it and what he thought about it, how it worked, how it didn't work. And um, I started experimenting with sort of weights and medicine balls and kettlebells, and not always in conventional ways that people are using them. And then isometric exercises and own body weight exercises, and then coordinating that with breath, and then taking those ideas and principles and trying to employ them on the mat. And that's really what I'm doing all the time in the classes in Hongu now. That's all I really do. I'm not interested in some kind of fast aerobic class or, I mean, I'll do it if I have to, but the idea of going there and like pounding people like I used to when I was younger just seems ridiculous. I can't be. As I said to you earlier, it can't be the other guy's fault all 5,452 times. Maybe I'm the problem. So, I mean, you know, I'm trying to trying to train a bit smarter. And um, but to answer your question, yeah, definitely. I don't understand the concepts of chi. You know, I, I don't yet. I'm kind of exploring that in my own sort of uh, infant way. And... Um, I, I, I find it fascinating because it's a way of now take, trying to take my Aikido to a new level. And then I think of my own, just living my own life on a daily basis, how to try to improve that as well. And I think this whole notion that I appealed to me from East Asia was this idea of sort of using a path or a way, whatever that way was, to develop myself as a human being. It's turned life into kind of a, a game in a way or an art. You know, the notion of trying to make your make your life a work of art. Unfortunately, on my work of art, I've spilled a lot of paint. <laughs> it's, it's finger painting. It's not always the best picture, but it's mine. It's your <laughs> I own it. I own it. <laughs> so, yeah, to answer your question, I do have a regimen I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. So, um, and, and all the people on the call. We know that's <laughs> Yeah, I'm. I don't feel. I'm not. I don't feel I'm in a position to, to sort of teach um, ideas. It's interesting though. I did teach a. Oh, I have a buddy that teaches at the British School here, and he asked me to come in and teach some playground Aikido to his group, his little Aikido group. And then I just showed him simple things. The kids loved it. It was like young, really young kids, and then um, uh, older teens and gave them some drills and things. And I would show them like, look, can you feel this? I'm now, all my power is coming from my shoulder and from my 
skeleton. Now can you feel this? I can, it's all coming from the floor and my feet pushing into the floor and then me sort of wringing my whole body like you'd wring a towel. And, um, you know, and then showing people how, you know, and breath power is real. It's not, I mean, think of someone putting the shot, right? You know, it, why, why are they exhaling? Why are they, you know, making a noise? Why are they, you know, if it was, if it was nonsense, if it didn't add anything, like lifting weights, it's the same thing, you know, so I mean, kind of a, go ahead. Jimmy Connor. Yeah, well, there's that. True. But, you know, it, there's there's um there's uh it's a new area that i've had experienced in my practice and was kind of like hey what's that all about oh this is interesting and then began to use in my own solo training and then now i'm trying to more formalize how i'm studying it with people that know more and have gone farther than i have and you know they're helping me and ultimately you got to do it yourself though, right? You have to experience it in your own. I can sit there and tell you how to surf all day long, but ultimately you've got to experience it yourself. And so that's what I'm trying to do. And, and I think that kind of training takes a real steady commitment. Yeah. You know, we were talking about, you know, Osensei in the past and things and, and really, you know, who's going to be doing what he did. I mean, he starts off as youth swimming then it's sumo and you're, you're, you're imbibing Japanese culture. And then he was so passionate about politics and everything. And then you've got farming and homesteading and, and judo and then all the koryu he did and the weapons and the army and, you know, um, going overseas. And, you, you know, you, can you create that same, that same, you know, kind of experience for human being? And then you have him going through Taikoryu and then he has Shingon Buddhism, esoteric Buddhism, and then Motokyo. And then is misogi, which involves all kinds of really steer practices. I mean, who's really doing that? There's a good book on that. Ellis Anders written a good book on that, which I ripped off all the ideas and I've told everybody um, <laughs> as if it's my own. Shh, don't tell him. He's a large human being. <laughs> Nobody knows. William, okay. you, throughout our conversation, you mentioned more times about China, your Chinese experience, and oh. major points of, in your life, definitely. And so you, you have the, um, you've been there for a while. Yeah. Uh, you took it on upon yourself to be to bring a Japanese martial art. Good lord, what was I thinking? Yeah, into <laughs> a tiny context. How do you say crazy in Italian? <laughs> Mato loco. <laughs> Mato. Mato loco. Maybe not that. Maybe it's stupid. No, I, it's. Go How, ahead. Give us a give us an idea. I, I suppose there's a, a lot of preconceptions too, because yeah, Chinese. I'm sure they don't do only Chinese things. You know, it's like uh, you need to eat, sure. you have to eat uh, pasta only. No, you eat right mainly, but you eat right. Enjoy a variety of different foods it's not uh, right one one way only so tell us a bit about your experience in in china what what is like being a a teacher of aikido in china sure well first of all i mean the people are the best thing about being there i mean i love i do i love the people and it's and it but it's different wherever you go it's kind of like being i mean the world's getting more homogenized but you know Italy has its regionalism, the States does, because of television and the internet and everything that's changing a bit. But so in China, it's a big place and there's lots, different cities are different, even they can't understand each other sometimes. But, you know, Beijing, I, I liked the people when I first went there, it was sort of the opposite of Japan, you know, the rural schmools, you know, it's sort of like, it, it's similar, but completely different. And and um, I went there originally because I, I had to leave Japan. My wife got very ill in Japan. And you, you know, you read that part in the book about where if I wasn't doing Budo, she, there's no doubt she would be dead. I would have made the wrong decision about going to the hospital or taking this ambulance and she'd be dead for sure. And um, anyway, and that would have been in 2003 before my daughter was born. And I probably would be in some bar in Ropongi, you know, if I was still alive, but um Anyway, so I end up 
getting to London because the insurance is through Lloyd's of London. And, you know, I had a chance through family contacts and things to probably land some different kind of job. But again, I had this opportunity. China was just opening up at the time. You know, everybody was running out to China and I proposed uh, starting a kind of advisory business in finance with three other guys I knew. It sounds almost like a joke, like an American, you know, a guy from the rugby school and two Scotsmen walk into a bar, you know, kind of sounds like that. But it's, uh, I think that's what started the first opium war actually was a couple of Scotsmen and a battleship, but you know, shush. Anyway, so, um, so we decided to do this advisory business and we were hunting around um, East Asia. And I added the idea, why don't we go to Korea and Japan at the same, like Sankaku, Sanjiao, you know, a, a triangle business model. So I started going out to China. I had been training in, in Chiba Sensei's dojo in Maida Vale and uh, that Steve Beecham was running at the time. And, um, and then when I go out to China, I went out and I decided I want to try Aikido. So I went to Suganuma Sensei's group in Beijing, in uh, Beijing University. And, you know, there's just a guy, just a tea, uh, student covering the class. Suganuma Sensei and Furuya Sensei lived in Hongu Dojo together. So I had a certain amount of extra respect for him. And um, it was great. China was just developing then. It was totally different than it is now. Very different, you know. And um, of course, if anyone's listening, I love it just as much. I would never say a bad thing, you know. So it was wonderful. And um, I, you know, it was changing. And, you know, like you said, Chinese people are starting to do different things. And economically, it's improving. And they want to try different kind of food. And they want to try different sports. And so Aikido is one of the things they wanted to try. And that had kind of started in 2002 as it, I mean, which is booming, you know. And um, I saw Beijing transformed architecturally and, and just the way it looked before the Olympics and then afterward as well. And I was training when I could at another place. There was um, Kase Sensei from New Zealand. Uh, a Hanbu Shihan that I knew from training days, Mori had come out, Mori Sensei had come out to Beijing and he sees me, he comes over, gives me a big hug on the mat and all the Chinese are like, who the hell is this white monkey? Why are they, you know, why do they all like, why does he like the, why does the Japanese guy like the white monkey? And, um, and we were old friends, you know, and then Suzuki that was taking his ukemi. And then of course, some of the Chinese came up to me and asked, would you come teach our dojo? And I said, we well, go ask your Shihan first if it's okay. And he said, Takasa Sensei, who's a great, uh, a great guy, actually, and he, he, a really good man. And he said, sure, yeah, have him go. And so I was doing that for a while. And then they kept changing locations, which just is a Beijing thing. It's like, you know, landlords, just, you know, uh, around the world, just tricksters pulling this, pulling that. You have to move places. And so I tired of that. And then I was doing BJJ and I didn't tell them I did Aikido. As two Americans were running it, they were students of Pedro Saur, who was a student of Hikam Gracie. And they came up to me one day and go, wait a second, I know you do martial arts because you sit in Seiza, you tie your own gi, and you pay attention, unlike the rest of the other students. <laughs> what traditional martial arts could you do? <laughs> and then I told them, and the guy was crazy about Aikido. He loved, he's, we're still friends. He's Chet Quinn. He's a great guy. He's down in uh, Jakarta now, I think. Jakarta or Kuala Lumpur. But um, really good guy. And then uh, they asked me, would I start lessons there? I said, sure. And it was great. It was like Christmas because I got, um, I got uh, Thai boxing students and I got, um, uh, got uh, Thai boxing students and BJJ students and people that are uh, much more physically capable than your average Aikido student. That's been the biggest trouble with Aikido. It's that the talent pool has gone like that. Because people like the guy I mentioned, Tony Hine, you know, 20 years ago, he's doing Aikido. Now he'd be doing BJJ. He'd probably be winning MMA fights is what he would be doing. Um, and so I was able to swap lessons. BJJ can be a bit expensive. So I was able to swap lessons. And then I started my own dojo eventually because again, these guys were running, not them and the Thai boxing partner, having to move places and this sort of thing got a bit ridiculous. And so I started my own dojo and that's how Beijing Aikikai was started. And it was growing pretty steadily up through 2015, 2016, 2017. And then some economic 
issues in China. And um, I, you know, and of course people try to dissuade people from coming to my dojo, you know, he's gonna break your arm, he's gonna hurt you, William's a monster. That's just wherever you go. And um, God bless him. And, you know, cause the, the trick is it's easy to try to attract somebody, but can you develop them and retain them? That's the really difficult thing to do. And um, that's, that's the really difficult thing to do as a teacher. You know, it, it doesn't matter what belt you, someone gives me, if I can't keep people on the mat, if I can't develop good students, then you know, what does it matter? So um, I just tried to encourage everybody there. I was organizing seminars for Hombu Dojo and I was, um, I was organizing seminars for Hombu Dojo there from time to time, eventually invited Miyamoto Shihan to come and um, just try to get along in the community and go down and join other seminars and things. Aikido really started in Shanghai and then it sort of launched in, which has a much greater Japanese presence than Beijing does. And then it started in, um, in, in Beijing. You can see in the book as I talk about it, and it, I think people, I'm sort of playing on people's stereotypes of China. And, I, and at the end, I'm like, no, it's not special. It's just as messed up as all the problems that it has, that Aikido has everywhere else in the world. You know, it's another set of human beings. Of course, it's going to have issues. But there's a lot of really sincere, good people. And I, mean, I love all my students, of course. And then it's, as people became more comfortable with me, right, because I'm not, Chinese. I don't know if anybody had noticed in the last, you know, couple hours. I'm, I'm another spoiler alert. Um, they, they took them, people a while to get used to me, and then now the sort of momentum building that, hey, you know, he's not, he's not trying to control. It's just manage it in a way that's, you know, you have to kind of grow the plant in whatever soil it's planted. And so um, I've been lucky now. I had a really um, um, some good people join me from another city and uh, were also very dear to me. And then that group grew from there to other cities. And then um, it's, I just got contacted again about someone else that wants to join. And it's just, just my way. There's a lot of other ways to do Aikido. It's like we talked about the big tent. Other people like the way they're doing it. Let them do it. And I, I tell my students, I said, no matter how hard we train, never, ever, ever look down on anybody else and their Aikido and what they're doing. They like what they're doing. And I said, and that kind of attitude just eats away at you like a cancer. So don't think of yourself as better. You're just doing what you enjoy and what you um, like, the way you want to express it. So, you know, um, it's... Uh, yeah, that's that's basically it. I mean, there's as far as martial arts go, you know, Chinese aren't typically as aggressive physically as maybe your average Westerner is. You know, um, the notion of sort of competitive sports is, was a relatively new thing, um, but they certainly excelled at it. You know, in the Olympics and things, and they have their own martial traditions like Shui Jiao, Chinese wrestling, which is quite formidable, and then various forms of Gong Fu, and you'd see people practicing it in the park and things. And uh, that's kind of going through its own development issues. I don't know the guy that was going around picking fights with Tai Chi masters, but I have friends that do. And um, uh, MMA and BJJ and boxing have become a little bit more popular. Sanda, which is kind of the fighting version of Chinese Kung Fu. But that's not going to appeal to that much of the society or that much of the population. There are not a whole lot of women doing most of it. Um, but yeah, and there's a lot, there's, you know, if you can find the right teacher and things, there's great things to learn in Chinese martial arts. And some of the weaponry is very interesting. And I mean, there's tremendous things you can learn. Unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to go to Shaolin, which I heard has been rather commercialized, but in Wudong Mountain, Wudong Shan, I wanted to go to where the birth of Tai Chi, and that's still potentially. Um, and now, I mean, look, I was originally, now can I say I'm not living there right now. I'm really living in, in Japan, in Tokyo. But the idea had been that my family would uh, move for my daughter's schooling and things and give my wife a diff, you know, different place to live for a bit. And me a chance to reconnect on a 
a more frequent basis. Some of the homeboo teachers are getting older. I still want to learn and absorb as much as I can. So um, I thought I'd go back to doing what I was doing originally in China. I was living in London and living in China until, gosh, when was that, 2014 or something, then principally in China. But I'd be three months in, three months out, four months in, two months out, like that. And uh, that broke it up nicely, both that I'd get bored in London and then, you know, head off to China. And then China, the pollution and things, I'd get a bit tired and you know, back. Um, so we thought we were coming to to Japan, and then you know we all know what happened. All the virus and things. It all you know um, became an issue on the twenty third of January, and and our family had a lot of personal loss from all of that as well. But going on as best we can, we went back to the states for a little bit, about nine months, which was again good for me because I got to see people I hadn't seen in years and kind of figure out what you know what we where we want to go in this changing world and. Was it back to London? Was it still in the States, the People's Republic of California? Or, um, or did I want to go back to Japan as planned? And then I decided, let's come back to Japan as planned. And so ultimately, I hope that the world will settle down enough when we realize this isn't the only virus ever created in the history of humankind. And um, we've been living with these things for ages. And um, we, I can get back to traveling. I mean, still have my flat in Beijing and um, you know, go back and sort all that out at some point. But we're coping and the dojos are going and, and um, you know, things are, are moving ahead as best we can, you know, as everyone's doing. Everyone's had more uh, pressing issues on their plate than whether or not they were practicing um, around the world. And some people haven't been able to practice. Practice is back on. People don't wear masks in training in, in China. And um, um, even children's classes are on. And in Hombu, they're wearing face masks. Well, um, the, the approach worldwide is very different. Uh, yeah. uh, um, over here, there's no, no training allowed. In Italy, it's the same. Many of right. the countries, you're, you're still only allowed to train outdoors and even at that sun, it comes and goes. So we need, really need to wait and see what happens and try and make them. Well, yeah, I wish everybody the best of success with that. Even the states, there you have states that are totally open and we have a federal system. So states are entitled to do that. You know, there's limited rights the federal government has, though they forget that from time to time. And um, they, they're able to take whatever approach they want. If the citizens in that state like it, there you go. That's why you pick one state over another. Just like you guys playing in the NBA or the NFL will often sign with Florida teams in Florida or Texas because there's no state income tax. You know, it's just you like the way they run things at one place. I like a flexible system like that. Let people do what they want. Let them have personal responsibility and personal agency in their lives. Just like we do on the mat. The Aikido should be building stronger, more adaptable human beings. That's what it should really be doing. It shouldn't be developing weaker and weaker and weaker offended, bothered people. It should make us you know, more resilient people so that less and less things in life um, unbalance you. I'm into that. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, we went through the two hours mark. Wow. Uh... <laughs> Thanks. Well, we'll chat again because I think there's many other things we can. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to do that. Yes, but uh, we need time. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Emilio, for the dialogue. This has been very, very interesting. Um, I hope people watching us and the people that will will have a look at this on the on YouTube later on will will enjoy. I hope it. So we did, and thank you for for sharing your your experiences and your insight, uh, insights with us. And I hope- Well, the, yeah, I'm not special, but some of my experiences are different. And if that can help people by sharing it, that's great. And I, I really wanna thank you for the service you're doing to the Aikido community, you know, and, and others that do likewise with these kind of, you know, forums and changes. It's an important thing to do and it's a selfless thing. Try to, to Thanks do- Thanks very much. In a, in a time that is, as we said, quite complicated, but uh, let's try and stay positive because uh, we're Budoka. We cannot allow anything really to, to, to change our path. No, uh, it, it's Correct. Time and 
this is what Budo is for. Otherwise, it wouldn't be training, no? Yeah, Amor Fati. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Emilia. Ciao. Adieu. Thank you so much. Ciao, William. Ciao. Ciao, everybody. Ciao. Uh, and shout out to little Isla who put up with me talking in the other room so loudly. She's got to go to bed now. Anyway, blessings, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.